I'm viewing this painting through the lens of a different perspective than the rest. This sense of being behind and still being in this internal space, I think it adds to that sense of isolation. I think he's also reflecting pretty deeply uh, into, you know, the circumstances and also looking forward. He thought about exactly how he's going to um, place the lines and the color. And I think of how those sort of represented these figures kind of going off, secluding themselves. It was a meditative practice. Um, well, to me, at first sight, it yeah. seems yeah. a bit similar to um, abstract ex expressionism. But then I realized that um, if you look closely to his uh, brushwork, um, it's really different from, for example, Pollock's, because I see his lines more as um, similar to calligraphy, like Chinese calligraphy. So it's like a different thing from abstract expressionism. And then um, I feel like this painting specifically reminds me of fireworks, which is a traditional element in Chinese Chinese. Uh, traditional, um, I don't know, Chinese tradition in general. You were saying that like the students are really responding to this one and for me this was the the only one that immediately jumped out to me as a landscape above all else. Like I recognize nature and I recognize space within the other paintings. Um, there's definitely a lot of elements combining the eastern and western elements and I felt like the sheer size of the canvas is just something to take note of throughout the gallery. And um, the colors, although vibrant, are kind of um, jarring in a way. Uh, that's kind of a controlled chaos, and I felt like it's something that I always liked about his style. Yeah, it just made me think of like the process and the labor that he needs to go through, like making this, like, cause the painting is like a really big scale. So I wonder like, like the labor and the process, like when, invested in making the painting. Uh, it reminds me about uh, Chinese calligraphy too, because I, I know the thickness and the texture of the material is kind of different, but uh, it both has the accidental feeling and uh, non-control in the painting and the calligraphy, like different from the Pollux painting. I definitely see autumn, but I also see so many different climates that take place in this one painting. Um, yeah, sorry. And oh no, I was just gonna say, and also like night, I mean, now that we're talking, we're talking about these as buildings, so I can't, you can't help but see a nightscape, uh, you know, neon lights that are flashing, uh, signage that you would see in a big city like Shanghai or Hong Kong or Wuhan, <laughs> uh, where the artist is coming from and working, yeah. Um, I just want to shortly say when, um, when Henny came to me about this event a few months ago um, and talked to me about participating in it and the format of the event, I was truly very excited because I was a student of studio art and art history in Los Angeles not too, too long ago, like a, a while ago, but not too long ago. <laughs> um, and I remember at that time feeling like there was this pretty immense gulf between um, what I was doing in my work at the time um, and my experiences in LA museums and galleries. There, to me, they were sort of these pristine places um, that I personally had some difficulty feeling super comfortable in. Um, whereas at home, my studio space, my desk, were these messes of different information and in inspirations and photographs and um, different ideas that I was excited about. So I'm kind of hoping that tonight we can bring in some of those ideas of you know, what you're excited about to have uh, kind of a more casual, informal exchange of information here. Um, and create some entry points into Zhang Fanzhi's work. So uh, Jenny and Hui Xiu have come up with some very thoughtful questions regarding Zhang Fanzhi's work. And I'm really here to just kind of 
facilitate the discussion around those questions, to prompt them, to maybe pass a microphone to someone who seems like they have an idea they'd like to share, um, and really be kind of an agent or, or director for the evening. But I, I think there is something interesting in, in how your experience alters depending on your location, relation to the work. Did anyone feel that way? Or <laughs> I have a related comment regarding the spatiality. Um, I think the gallery space is, also, is very interesting in it that it puts into question chronology or like, ser like whether they were created into a series and makes you wonder how, what is the relationship between these two and finding similarities mm. between them and what order should we perceive them? And actually, I would like to know when they're created. Mm. Yes. Yeah, these pieces are made between 2018 and now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Two. Yeah. We, we, the same question came up in some of our smaller group conversations, um, especially because we started talking about, since the artist is from Wuhan, mm -hmm. what the timeline was in terms of relationship to the emergence of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I think you might know a little bit more, Susie, about the artist process. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, the response um, about the frame or the questions about the frame had to do with the way that the paintings felt so, um, in some ways, in some ways, there's this dichotomy between a sense of order and then total chaos and messiness oh, yeah, and definitely. like this potential to expand on and on. And then that kind of gets jolted, um, closed by the frames themselves. And we're curious about if you know about the artist's working process yeah, um, and his preferences for frames and things like that. So Zhang Fang Zhi, he actually, he has a very, he has a very kind of slow and thoughtful process when it comes to laying out these works. Um, I was mentioning earlier when we were in the smaller group discussions, I think that there's kind of a knee jerk reaction that we can have coming from um, the United States thinking, oh, a work like this, you know, it looks like Jackson Pollock. It looks like something that's spontaneously created through splashes. And that's really not what some Fungers process or technique is about. Um, if you don't mind stepping a little bit closer, because I think this is a situation where your view of the work does truly change when you're um, reading it from close up versus a little bit further away. You can see the way that he's pushed paint kind of through the surface of the canvas. Um, and each of these lines, um, he has kind of specifically planned prior to completing the painting. So oftentimes he'll create a smaller sketch. Um, he'll spend you know, prolonged periods of time figuring out exactly where to place a stroke so that it adds to the composition in the way that he wants it to. It's a very, um, it's a very thoughtful and slow process. Um, so over the past few years, unrest surrounding strict COVID lockdowns and government censorship have spurred further internet control and monitoring by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, these issues are truly pervasive in cities like Beijing where Zhang Fanzhi currently works. Um, and of course, um, Wuhan, his, his um, hometown has a specific um, relationship as sort of the center of uh, the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you feel that these paintings respond to or defy or completely ignore um, the current kind of sociopolitical context in both China and around the world? Um, and is it appropriate for us to consider Zhang Fanzhi's work in relation to this, or is it something that we shouldn't be thinking about at all? We were just mentioning how it is hard not to, once you kind of understood the time period that most of them are created post COVID. I don't know if it's a mental connection that we make as viewers or more so the intention of the artist, but a lot of the abstract expressionism expressed in the paintings, you could see them, or at least I see them as very bodily um, vessels and nervous systems and very 
biology kind of centric in a way. And、um, one of the paintings that I love the most actually is the one over there. If if we could take a this one right here. We just felt like compared to the other、um, compared to the other paintings in the gallery, the saturation of this one just seems a little bit lower, and.、Um, For me, I see a horizon line. I see reflection in the water, but my view is kind of obscured by these lines.、Um, the desaturated nature of the painting gave me a sense of that I'm viewing this painting through the lens of a different perspective than the rest. I almost feel very monstrous in nature, like the perspective itself, and、uh, there's a sense of nostalgia and longing.、Um, the colors are faded, but. The emotion is very high, and I couldn't help but relate it to perhaps a sense of isolation. I think you you spoke about the sense of like isolation in this work, and I also, for me, this work immediately stood out to me as having a sense of light. Like it seems like there is light streaming in from somewhere, and it's reflecting on this water, and that paired with this sense of being. Behind something,、um, I think you describe them as brambles.、Um, my classmate first saw them as like wires, but the sense of being behind and still being in this internal space, I think it adds to that sense of isolation. And I, I don't know, it really drew me to this painting. I think this one's my favorite as well.、Um, I guess a part of kind of what I was thinking、um, about this exhibition is. Uh, I'm assuming the artist、uh, Zhang Fanjun knows that he's going to be exhibiting his work that he's produced in China in the States when he was、uh, making all of these work, and and that and that there is this sort of inherent displacement to that、um, to that process, whole process, and there is also this switch from its sort of early, very sort of commercially su- successful figurative paintings to sort of all of these really abstract, large scale. Um, paintings that sort of are, you know, kind of almost exploring kind of new artistic style.、Um, and what I'm wondering is, this is not sort of a definite answer to the question, but I think is kind of worth to think about、um, whether he is thinking about this displacement, inherent displacement in his work in terms of politics, and whether abstraction offers a possibility of ambiguity or sort of murkiness to. Or、certain type of struggle, that is not, you know, that is、um, almost ambiguity that sort of gives more agency <laughs> to himself as an artist, rather than sort of, you know, being read in political terms, or you know, or having that generate other things for himself, or you know, and I think, you know, perhaps abstraction could be a strategy, but that's that's、um, a possibility and. And you know, because precisely because of how ambiguous it could be, you know, this is as far as sort of we could sort of think about it.、Um, yeah. Do you mean kind of he uses this ambiguity as a potential replacement of、um, uh, criticism? Oh no, no, no! I'm not talking about criticisms precisely. I'm talking about sort of because of. A sort of slipperiness that is both aware of the censorship back home, but also aware, sort of, a potential that his politics is displaced. That that you know, in his back, the the sort of paintings from his earlier career, though you know, those could have a really sort of rather sort of straightforward and very easily have this really straightforward sort of political read by an audience that is not from where he is from. He does think deeply about. Um, his place as an artist from China and also an international artist, and the way that his work is viewed as both Eastern and Western, as as he says it,、um, is relating to these different art histories specifically, and I mean also contemporary histories. With the global pandemic, this is these feelings of isolation are something that we have as sort of a universal experience right now. And also, part of the ambiguity could be potentially sort of striving for a more universal 
read rather than a sort of specific localized sort of read. Those are, yeah. Well, I, I think the key notion you mentioned is the strategy. The, uh, uh, he was pondering mm -hmm. and kind of confronting that also. So it's looking outward, but also looking inwardly. And as an artist, uh, uh, successful as he is, I mean, he's extremely um, alert of what's all going on, you know. So I, I think you, you, you know, I, I like your comment. I think this uh, a strategy or, you know, insert himself as agency, kind of forward looking and pushing forward. And that's actually, I, uh, we all found that's what's interesting about uh, Zheng Huanzi, <laughs> not really repeating himself, kind of keep exploring and engage in, as you mentioned, East or West. So um, later, I'm going to come back about, you know, how um, in our class discussion, we're very concerned about, you know, how an artist position himself and also looking at the more microcosmically of the artist's personal trajectory in the development of artistic career, but also look at outwardly, you know, that uh, um, we're, we're all in a very critical moment, particularly we have experienced the past three some years. So I think he's also reflecting pretty deeply uh, into, you know, the circumstances and also looking forward. But uh, later I would like to come back, I'll pose a question for all of us is that, um, I mean, the, the, um, the status of the, um, the situation of, uh, you know, trying to be a global artist, a Chinese artist, and how you position yourself, right? And is the Chineseness a selling point? Uh, whether, you know, it, it's not even considering the market, but the, how you establish yourself, right? And it's easy to say you want to be a global artist, but how, right? And without that, identity, uh, I, know, I, I think it's very easy to get lost, right? So I actually see a lot of Chineseness in um, the, the painting. I mean, he's earlier figurative or reflecting China, reflecting Chinese people, right? In the different uh, historical um, um, circumstances. But so are this group of um, artwork. I, I, I see the, there's something, a consistency, you know, and, and that's something that our historian we're most interested in, you know, kind of the consistency, but, you know, moving forward. And um, so I would like to think a lot of people comment on this uh, and pandemic, the circumstances in the recent history. Oh. Yes really quick something that I found interesting was like that the bold black lines reminded me a little bit of his earlier work where he would put calligraphy in the work as well and I think it's interesting how these lines are clearly very deliberate and yet they're um, in a way passing they're using the tradition a little bit but then also um, evolving also so that's what I was thinking about it can you sense it? We kind of like talk about it and we feel like he would do like a solid color as the background at first. And then like the thicker, bolder black line is kind of like the second layer. And then there are like this thinner line that coming after that. It's kind of, except for these two, that's more like chaotic. Like we don't really know the um, process of the layering, but the rest is like we can kind of tell. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting to me that he's, you know, coming out of having been born right prior to the Cultural Revolution when there was a very um, uh, top down um, uh, program of promoting propaganda art and thinking about art as a revolutionary tool to support Maoist doctrine and using um, figurative painting um, to those ends. And then, this, and then him coming out of that and working with figurative painting uh, and then making this move to abstraction. And I guess you were asking like, is this a kind of a global a strategy on the way to becoming a global artist? I think there's a lot in his mind that we can read into and make it really interesting. Any more comments? Uh, somebody from his hometown, Wuhan. You see him as an artist from Wuhan, and you know his artwork like this. Would I say something? 
Yeah. Um, so just as Professor Lee mentioned, I was born in born and raised in Wuhan, just like him. And then um, um, I feel like it's for me personally, it's very hard to avoid like feeling and talking about um, political stuff happening in China right now, especially in Wuhan. And um, I can't read too much into his political intentions myself, but um, I feel like um, I feel like as, as as a sensible person, you either go into meditation yourself or you just go on the streets and you do something to protest or something like that. And um, obviously, I think he chose the meditation because um, I feel like these paintings are not like um, not like Pollock's because Pollock is all about um, energetic movement. But with his lines, I see just as Professor Lee mentioned more as calligraphy is a meditative process. And um, I watched a video. He uh, he obviously like um, he thought about exactly how he's going to um, place the lines and the color of these lines. So I think that is a very much inward looking process of himself. Just, um, I don't, uh, but I don't know if it has any political intentions into that. So, yeah. I was thinking how the difference between Pollock and um, these paintings, especially given if you look at the edge of the paintings, it just seemed way more controlled in terms of the strokes. There's not really splashes. Everything felt intentional. And like you said, it was very carving into the canvas itself. But I, it's interesting because when you think about contemporary Chinese artists, especially outside of painting, perhaps new media, where Chineseness is not defined by the techniques or caricatures or iconography to do with China, um, if you think of artists like Cao Fei or Lu Yang, um, when they speak of Chineseness or when they speak of themselves, uh, when asked about whether they consider themselves a global artist or Chinese artist, they often um, dance around the subject in the sense that um, being a Chinese artist in this day of age is very, uh, you get put on the political pedestal. And so, I feel like the sense of displacement that I feel from these paintings may be the overarching theme for the direction of contemporary Chinese artists. A sense of displacement is the new identity for that, of having to always comment under the radar. There's almost a sense of dark humor of being an artist and being able to express freely, but knowing that the larger system is at play with you and you having to dance around that in a very subtle way. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of a sense of community among artists who are having to do that. Um, and now, as you know, there's increased communication, um, there's increased access to travel. Um, China has kind of opened up to um, people coming in and living there since you know contemporary Chinese art was begun in the 1970s or 80s, depending on how you see it. Um, but is it still appropriate to classify an artist like Zheng Fanzhi as primarily Chinese? Or should he be classified as primarily global? How do we contextualize his work from a Western space? What's the appropriate way to position an artist like Tsung Fan Zhi in a gallery like Hazard and Worth? I know that's a big question, but if anybody has thoughts. Yeah. Um, on one end, I, I understand there is a danger in pigeonholing an artist based on their nationality. Um, on the other end, though, I do think it's important to recognize these echoes to the past that Professor Lee mentioned. I'm looking at certain forms like this one over here, or even over there, the yellow, and I think of like the ink wash mountainscapes that I think you were chatting about as well. Um, and I think of how 
those sort of represented these figures kind of going off, secluding themselves. It was a meditative practice, which I think really lines up with what Annie had mentioned as well. Uh, so I think there's also strength in recognizing these ties to like a cultural past that help us recognize themes that the artist is addressing, while not necessarily limiting them to producing art in a certain style. Um, of these paintings, the artist states, quote, they are not real landscapes. They are about an experience of Miao Wu, marvelous revelation. Um, and that's this kind of revelation. Instead of making something obvious, this marvelous revelation brings about an unmarked world, which underlies the deep strata of life, both novel and familiar, constituting a restless journey of discovery. Do you, do you see these inspirations? Which of these inspirations or points of reference do you see in these paintings? Well, the, actually, I, I wouldn't make too much uh, uh, of this so-called, you know, his references. I mean, he, um, and how deep he is involved. I mean, the claim of, uh, he come up from Northern Wei Songyuan. Northern Wei is known for, you know, all the Buddhist uh, uh, arts. And also, all the Buddhist art has uh, inscription, right, to comm uh, commemorate it. So that's his Northern Way source, but that really has very little to do with the painting tradition. And if Song and Yuan, uh, that's the heydays of Chinese uh, uh, classical painting, also calligraphy, but it's significant. But again, I think by training, he is an oil painter, right? So they all have uh, this uh, uh, curriculum at school. And I believe that he's a very curious, he has a very curious mind and very diligent. So it seems the Gangsu, all this, so I think everybody can have a claim that you come in on the tradition, literati, what the art is expression in, in instead of just a craftsmanship, right? And go beyond representation. And art is uh, you know, a outlet of emotion. And, and I think that's really universal. It's really, so I, I, I would suggest not to dwell too much on that, but I, I think, again, as a Chinese artist, how you make it as a global artist, I think that must be really in his mind. Right? But, but I, what I, 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 I found the most interesting was that the, his uh, take on Chinese, you can say calligraphy or auto writing or, um, and had uh, uh, kind of uh, transformed, uh, had uplifted to a different level and um, has all the uh, endeavor to communicate in a more universal way. That, that's my takeaway, yeah. <laughs> How has your, you know, how has your view of these works um, changed from the time you entered this space to now, to after this discussion? Does anyone want to share? Well, here's the thing. In my honest, humble opinion, when I come into the, like, the space, I didn't think much about, like, oh, I have to analyze the, the paintings. I have to, like, think about, like, oh, what's going on behind him creating these paintings and like I just basically go in here and like feel whatever I feel and I just saw like I was like yeah they're pretty cool but then <laughs> I didn't think much honestly but um if you do come like one step closer and then like listen to what's going on like based on the some background info on him and also like with the context of our society and our relationship with China and the, the 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 world you you can understand a little bit better by like these simple colors and these simple straight lines and yeah everything have a meaning i guess let's have one final reflection did you did anybody else want to talk about what's changed between when you first entered this space and you know what you um come to think about these works yeah I feel like what changed for me is that when I first came in, I felt like the pieces had a lot of freedom and room to breathe. But now upon knowing the process, of the conceptualization of everything, I felt that they seemed more self-contained. And I felt like the, camp, the, the framing also give it a sense of less room to breathe. Like everything is very tight but that might be the intention. And I think as a Chinese artist, the need for globalization or need to be classified as a global artist may not be or shouldn't be in my opinion on 
on the forefront of your mind because if your intention is to be something so off so often you kind of overcompromise and go the other route and i do love those paintings over there i felt like they appealed to me the most too and that wasn't the um feeling when i first walked in